morning, Columbia. Good morning. Good morning. It's such great energy in the room. And I have a little background music here as well, I think. <laughs> Backup singers, right? I appreciate that. Um, this is a great weekend and, and so important. I think it is probably something I was uh, speaking with one of the leaders in the Alumni Association that's a little bit unique to Columbia, this, this sense of community and really cultivating and nurturing and connecting all of the leaders of, of the effort in this institution together for this weekend. I know you guys had a late night last night. Uh, there was a great uh, camaraderie and connection and learning and you have a lot planned. I, I'm really honored and grateful. I, I'm thankful to Brian, I'm thankful to Ken, I'm thankful to the leadership at Columbia for inviting me to share in this weekend with you. Leadership is, is extremely important. Um, it's extremely important for the vitality and the strength and the forward progress, not only of the institution that we love and that we're working so hard to advance, but it's important for the communities that we live in, that we work in, uh, for our own families. When we think about the headlines of the day, um, and there's one headline I will not mention. <laughs> the other ones, the really important ones, right? Like what's happening in Syria, uh, the state of our educational system in this country. The fact that even in this city, there are 2.7 million New Yorkers that don't make enough money to make ends meet and every day are making choices about whether to pay the rent or to buy groceries. Those are the really big, complex challenges that we have to deal with. So really strong, robust leadership is critical, not only in solving the problems and the challenges that we face, but also in unleashing our potential. And, 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 and that's why I'm excited uh, to be here. I, I, I'm humbled that you all would think that in my experiences, that I might have something to share. I've had some leadership roles in high school, college, law school, whether it was on a sports team or the sorority or student government. Um, I had the opportunity and the privilege to serve as the leader of a community and economic development corporation serving the Harlem community, this community. And as Brian mentioned, the president and CEO of United Way of New York City. So I draw from my own experiences, but also from observations of other really strong, competent leaders. And there are four things I wanna share with you this morning um, that in my view are really important traits and characteristics to being a strong leader. Those four things uh, include um, one, leaders need to be visionary. Really have a bold vision and view of what you are leading people to do. What are you leading them toward? It has to be bold and significant. And I think that's really important, an important component of strong leadership. In addition, you have to be smart, analytical, data-driven, clear, but also very strategic on appreciating what's happening on the ground and able to adapt. So smart and strategic, I put as two and three. And finally, you have to be courageous to really get up and do what you know needs doing, uh, to put your shoulder to the plow day after day, and to push toward that bold vision takes, takes a bit of courage. Um, I start with visionary, and I think it's important. It, I, don't, I don't really mean, you know, pie in the sky, you know, give peace a chance, let's have all, you know, a great feel-good moment. I think one of the real challenges with leadership today is that we don't set bold enough goals, right? We are often too satisfied with where we are, the status quo. And we think sometimes that our job as the leader is to maintain, right, where things stand. If you are a leader, if you are put in a position of power and influence, 
Your responsibility is to take that organization, institution, whatever entity you're leading, further than it's gone. Because if you're simply, you know, just doing what has been done, you're not a leader, you're a manager. So leaders need to be bolder. Gandhi uh, said the difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would solve most of the world's problems. We are capable of doing so much more than we're doing. And it really starts with that bold goal, clarifying really very, very clearly what is the vision of what we want to achieve. When I was at Columbia in the 80s, I was very active and involved and engaged in the social justice movement around what was happening in South Africa and ending apartheid. And Nelson Mandela is absolutely one of my heroes. And I think about the, the boldness of the vision that he and his, his comrades set. We're going to end apartheid. It's not we're going to make it better. We're going to you know, make the past rules a little bit more lax. We're going to have these incremental steps. It was we're going to end it. Over, done. And the problem and the challenge with really setting a bold vision is that you have all the naysayers, all the people that will tell you why it can't happen, what are the challenges, what are the hurdles, the conventional wisdom is convenient. And as a leader, you, you, you've got to set the bar higher than that. And that is really, really important. I think about our own institution, Lee Bollinger. I'm sure when he had that vision around Manhattanville, people thought he was crazy. They said, there's no way you can do that. The community will push back. You can't raise that much money. We've never done it before. And I live in Harlem up the hill, and seeing that vision being realized, it, it took a bold vision to say, this is what we need as an institution, and this is what we're going to do to get there. When I started at United Way of New York City, um, in that middle of that crisis, and it is a significant and important institution, and for many, many years, United Way has stood in the gap for low-income New Yorkers. We have helped people prevent eviction. We have helped people who are food insecure put food on the table when they did not have a means to do it. We looked at attendance rates in some of the most challenged neighborhoods and communities and worked hard to make sure that those rates were increased. And what we were doing was crisis intervention. And as I came on board with the, the phenomenal leadership that we have, the Board of Directors of United Way of New York City and the team, we decided to adopt a bigger vision than just trying to plug a crisis. We said the issue that plagues low-income communities in New York City is that they don't have enough income to make ends meet. And our goal is not about how do you get out of poverty, how do you plug that gap, how do you plug that crisis, but how do we help New Yorkers achieve a level of self-sufficiency? That's a much bigger and bolder vision and goal. And there are people that will say, well, that's not possible. It can't be solved. There are these entrenched challenges and issues and the politics and all of the rest. But what buoys me is that there are always people who have said in the past that something could not be done. All of the reasons that people gave that where apartheid would never be over, where women would never get the right to vote, right? Where we would never get past Jim Crow as a country. The people that held the vision, the leaders that said, that can't stop us. Another wonderful quote from my hero, Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. So really appreciating that 
boldness of the vision, and you have to embrace it as a leader. One of the things that's also important is appreciating that you don't, you don't create the vision all by yourself. You need to build the vision collectively. Leadership needs to be distributed wherever you stand. Because there are lots of skills and attributes and qualities that need to go into creating a shared vision that is bold enough to get the job done. The other thing that's really important is that the vision has to be clear. It can't be convoluted. It can't be a creative writing example. It has to be clear. People have to see it. They have to visualize it. They have to be able to walk into it. And your job as the leader is to be bold and make sure that the vision is clear and adapted by the people that you are leading and that you're working with. The, the other thing is, you know, once you have this great, bold, clear vision, you really have to have a strategy about how you're going to get it done. Um, there are lots of wonderful platitudes and flowery things we can think about and dream about, but leaders have to also hold the vision and the strategy of how to get things done. Thomas Edison said, vision without execution is a hallucination. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what it is. I mean, we can you know, think back to our college years and all the hallucinogens and everything else, but <laughs> vision needs a plan. The plan has to be data-driven, but it also has to appreciate field conditions. I think sometimes when we are as highly educated as we are at Columbia, we think that you know, if we have the data, the analytics, the spreadsheets, the, you know, the quantifiable information, then that's enough. We'll have figured it out. Then we try to test it on the ground, and we realize that that's not quite enough. But data is important. Data and information, I have two books on my desk in my office, and some of my colleagues um, get a little intimidated when they, when they see them, but they're things that I turn to often. One book is entitled, Trying Hard is Not Good Enough, and the other book is entitled, Get Shit Done. <laughs> so as you can imagine, coming into my office, they're like, okay, here we go. <laughs> You know, what is it we need to do? But, but these two things are really bedrocks for me. You need, trying hard is not good enough, how to produce measurable improvements for customers and communities. It's a phenomenal book. It's about results-based accountability, data-driven decision-making, and how do you measure performance. These are things that you have to have. You just can't be visionary. You have to really have the blueprint of how we're going to get it done. And that other piece is the strategy. So once you have the blueprint, you have to understand the field conditions. What is happening on the ground that's going to get in the way of your beautifully spread laid plan, your spreadsheet, the, the things that you've kind of thought through with all of your smarts, your Columbia smarts. And that strategy, that appreciation of the ground conditions is very, very important for leaders to have, that ability and also the agility to adjust. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was leading the Abyssinian Development Corporation, which is a community and economic development corporation in Harlem, one of the things that we engaged in was preserving affordable housing. Um, at the time, there were thousands and thousands of units in Harlem that had 15 or 20 years ago been built as affordable housing with the promise to the owner that if you keep it affordable for 15 or 20 years, that affordability re restriction will expire, and then you can convert it to market rate. But if you keep it affordable, they gave them tax credits and other benefits for that affordability period. So what we were seeing in the community was that the affordability restrictions were all expiring 
at the same time that the real estate value was going through the roof. So you had owners, many of them had done what they said they were going to do, and now they wanted to reap the return on their investment. Some of them went about that in reasonable ways, and they tried to negotiate and figure out how they could do some preservation, but also get a return. And then there were some owners that were just bad actors. They were bad people. And they wanted to get the people out of those apartments by any means necessary. There was one housing development um, that had 231 families. And it was a, a, a prime, prime real estate parcel. And the owners had done every horrible thing that you could imagine. There was not electricity, running water. They didn't make repairs. When it rained outside, it was like it rained inside. There was mold growing up the walls and mushrooms coming out of people's carpets. The sewage line had collapsed, and they actually excavated the, where to do repairs. And they did this 20 foot by 8 foot open pit. And then they figured out how much it would cost, and they said, just leave it like that. There was a 20 foot by 8 foot open pit of raw sewage in this building for two years. 231 families were struggling. They couldn't, and there was nowhere else for them to go. The affordable housing was out of, the housing costs were out of their reach. So they came to us, they came to Abyssinia Development Corporation and they said, please work with us. Please help us preserve and repair our housing. It wasn't on our plan, it wasn't on our agenda to do, but it was a priority and a need from the community, and we met it. We went in and we fought, and we had a bold goal that we were gonna rehabilitate this housing. We were strategic and thoughtful, we had a plan, and we got it done, we, we took over the building, we got the resources to do the rehab, and I remember the tenant meeting, I was so just excited. I stood in front of these families and I said, you know, we did it, we're about to start the repairs, and the people were angry at me. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand. I said, yes, well, here are the new appliances and we're gonna do this construction, and hand after hand went up and said, is there gonna be a lot of dust in this construction? It's like, uh, yeah, there will be, but this is how we're going to mitigate the dust and everything else. Uh, they're like, well, what about that stove, that, that, that sample you have there? Is it self-cleaning? Is it a self-cleaning stove? I said, is it a self-cleaning stove? No, no, I'm sorry. It's like, how, how could you give us stoves that are not? I mean, and the people were angry. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I, I didn't ask to come. You, you asked us to come here. We, we fought this fight together. What is going on? I didn't understand. I didn't understand the ground conditions. And it was really with the help of a professor at Columbia, Dr. Mindy Fullilove. Dr. Fullilove is actually a trained psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of work around urban planning, and she wrote this wonderful book called Root Shock. And it talks about the psyche of communities and neighborhoods that have been the subject of, of displacement, and what happens to a community, and what happens to the people. So I said, I don't know what these people, I, you know, I've done, I don't know what to do. But if I weren't able to get the cooperation of the residents, we, we had to move people from one apartment to the next in a very short period of time in order to continue to pay the debt and get the re rehabilitation done. I had no margin for error, and these people were not going to be cooperating. So I asked Dr. Fulov, I don't understand, what is it? So she did a, what's called a situation analysis. She interviewed the people. She understood what the problems and the challenges were. She said, Sheena, these people are like burn victims, and you're touching them. It doesn't matter that you're touching them to be helpful or that they've asked you to come in and touch them, but you're touching them. And that's a situation on the ground you have to appreciate. So your beautiful blueprint and your plan that you have developed with all the data-informed strategies, you have to adjust it to take into account how they're feeling. 
the pain that they've experienced. You have to leave room and space for them to express that, and you have to work around it. And there are certain things that you can do, and there are certain things that you cannot do. And that helped guide us to a successful rehabilitation of that project. So really not just the data, you know, the, the quants, that, those skills, but having that emotional quotient and understanding and being strategic about what's happening on the ground is critically important. And that work is no different than uh, when I worked at Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, or Rabul McMurray that specialized in private equity. You know, you can do a whole strategy about what a merger is gonna look like, and then actually try to get it done with the personalities and the energy and the culture. Those are things that you have to take into consideration. So being, having a vision that is actionable, data-driven, takes into account field conditions, and making sure that you have the agility to change and that you're learning all the time are all really important things as a leader. But the, the thing that drives, I think, really strong leadership is courage. I mean, when you think about it, um, the whole bold vision and apartheid or build Manhattanville or, and then you think about all the strategies and the plans and, and, and the details of how to get it done, that in and of itself just makes you say, whew, like I'm tired, I'm done. Like that was, that was good work. But to actually get up and do it, that's a whole nother thing the courage and the fortitude to put your shoulder to the plow and to push forward. That is powerful. I go back to that Gandhi quote. The difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would solve most of the world's problems. This is where a lot of times leaders fall back and fall down. We, we, we don't have the courage always to push through. We can, we can state the vision and we can develop the plan and strategy and we can start doing it, but then sometimes we just, we peter out. And I believe, and what I've learned in my own experience is that courage, to me, really starts with confidence. Because I think one of the reasons that sometimes we, we peter out is because we don't really believe that we're the ones to carry it home. We're, we're not always exactly sure that we are the leader for this occasion. I learned that lesson um, early when I was in high school. I, um, I grew up in the Bronx in the South Bronx and I went to a boarding school in Newtown, Pennsylvania that had more cows than people. So it was a different experience. And um, I came from, you know, not the best uh, educational system to a school that had all of these resources and, you know, one of the big things that was important at the school was sports. Everybody had to do a sport. And I'd never done a sport. I was entering high school. I had never done really any real organized team sport in a school setting. And so I kind of lost track of this requirement. And it was the last day where you had to sign up for something. And I was looking on the bulletin board, and there was this thing called X Country. And I said, <laughs> I don't know what that is. I'll show up. I showed up at 3 o'clock. I really, literally did not know it. I had my little tennis shoes on, completely unprepared. And the coach, you know, said, okay, let's go. And so we started running. I ran this cross-country course I'd never run, I'd never run before. Finished the course with the coach, and she looks at me and she says, do you, do you know what you just did? I was like, I don't know, I was just following you. I did what you said. <laughs> what is this thing? We could do this. And I actually had a skill, a capability that I didn't know I had. So in the first race of my high school career, I won the race. And I just was like, well, OK, that, that works. <laughs> the second race, 
the coach, the first race, you know, I was a freshman and knew, you know, I was somewhere in the back. The second race, she put me on the first post. I said, like, uh-oh. That means that you're the best runner on the team. There was an expectation that she had that I would win the race. I was scared to death. I said, oh, no. I started sweating. We had this. We started the race, and it was a kind of an open field, and then you hit the woods. So I start running on this open field. We hit the woods, and I stopped. And I like hid behind the tree for the rest of the race. I was like, Lord have mercy, this is too stressful. And I came out, and she's like, what happened? What did you do? I said, I didn't know what to do. You put me in the first post, like you expected me to win the race. And she was like, Sheena, you have to have confidence in your ability. Run your race. I know you're capable of achieving high levels in this sport. You have the skill. You have the strategy, you have the mindset, but you have to believe in yourself. And, and that was really, really powerful and, and meaningful and a, a big lesson for me. And there's this one um, poet or writer, Marianne Williamson, that, that I've carried in my heart um, since that day. And, and as a leader, I, I often have to go back to her words. She says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Right? It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us. It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And so I do have a strong reservoir of faith. That's a, a, a big part of who I am. And in really appreciating my own capabilities and in stepping into that. So I did go on to have a good running career in high school. I actually set a course record that stood for 25 years. I was. Uh, Surprise, but really appreciating your capabilities and stepping into yourself and having the faith and the conviction and the courage, the confidence to be courageous is really important. Reminding yourselves that you're in a position of leadership for a reason because you actually have the capability to get the job done. And then finally, I think, that's also something that's also a part of courage is stamina. The ability to push through when it's exhausting and challenging. And, and I don't mean like, like a bully stamina. Like I'm gonna just knock everybody down and out of my way. But, but really trying to get the work done and advance the goal. Because we don't want Pyrrhic victories, right? We don't want victories that where we won, but everybody's dead, except for one of our guys. We, we want real victory in the goals that we set. So the stamina, and I go back to Nelson Mandela. I had the, the great privilege and opportunity to visit South Africa last year. And I got to stand by the cell that he stayed in for 18 years of his 27 years of imprisonment. 27 years, he held fast to the bold goal of ending apartheid. 27 years. And I think about that, and I think, well, come on, Sheena. You can do what you need to do, right? <laughs> if, if not, I mean, you have to summon it. You have to muster it up. You have to have 
inspiration to keep going because it's not supposed to be easy. Because you set a bold goal. You set a high mark. And you've, you've mustered all of your intellect and your strategy and all of that to get it done. So to keep pushing forward is the other element of what I believe is a courageousness that leaders should have. And, and in closing, as, as I think about um, all of these great leaders, and I have all of these leaders that I think about all the time, like Nelson Mandela and uh, Desmond Tutu and uh, Harriet Tubman and Mother Teresa, she's one of my favorites. Um, but I also think about the leaders that are closer to home. I think a lot about my mother. My mother uh, was the leader, is the leader, she definitely still is the leader, of our family. <laughs> She's a strong personality. And um, also a leader in business, in the nonprofit sector. But I think about her a lot when I think about my own leadership style and the types of things that I need to be focused on. And she absolutely embodies the, the visionary, the smart, the strategic thinker, and the courageous leader. My mother um, was born in Harlem and grew up in the Bronx. And she had her first child when she was 15 years old. Yeah, ouch, right? That's what I'm saying. Ouch, my older sister. Then she had me at 17. And her and my father, they had this, this notion that they, it was all going to be great, and they were going to get married and raise these babies. And by the time she was 19, she was a single parent. And what amazes me about my mother is that she had a vision for us and for herself that was absolutely bold. She, there, in her mind's eye, there was nothing that her girls could not achieve. There was nothing that she couldn't achieve, even though the conventional wisdom said, you're a single teenage mother. It's over for you, for your kids, for their kids. There's nothing that can be done. She had a bold vision that we were going to do anything we set our minds to. She continued to go to school. She never stopped going to school. She went to the high school for pregnant girls. She went to Hunter College. She took us with her. Um, and she made sure, as she was advancing, that we had the opportunities that we deserved. As I said earlier, I grew up in the South Bronx, and all of the elementary schools in my community were not good. They were bad. There was, there, it was terrible. My mother struggled with that. She did as much as she could with us at home. She tried to supplement in any way she could between the three jobs that she was doing and the, and, the, and, the, um, and the school that she was going to. And then she got smart. She said, OK, this zip code is not going to produce the opportunities that my children deserve. So I need to figure out which zip code will. And there was a zip code in the North Bronx that actually had good quality schools and arts programming and all these things and enrichment that she believed that we deserved. So she set out and filled out the applications and everything else, and she did the data analysis to figure out what needed to happen, but then she also had to be strategic. You had to live in that zip code. So she said, we live there. <laughs> she got some address, you know, somebody's address, because you have to figure out the field conditions, right? So she was very strategic and getting us a seat in that middle school. And it was from there, that was the first time in my life that I had a quality educational experience and opportunity. It was from that experience that I got the full scholarship to the boarding school that had more cows than people, where I started to learn how to run. And it was from there that I got to Columbia, where I entered as a freshman at 16. And from there, that I went to Columbia Law School and was able to graduate having been a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar. It was because she had that bold vision for me 
And she was smart and strategic and courageous. She never let up my mother, never, never. She always had high expectations for us. I remember once in high school, I was not, I majored in history and sociology at Columbia, I went to law school. So sciences, I didn't really think were my thing. And I thought, ah, you know, I can do well everywhere else. And I think I came home, oh gosh, one test, one day with a D on a chemistry test. My mother looked at me, she said, what is this? She said, D is for dummies, and I don't have any of those. <laughs> so you better figure out what you need to do. Because she was like, you're, you're capable of more than this. It might be harder, but you can do better. You know, that confidence, that high expectation. So I went back and I, I ended the year with a B, and it was hard. And I will admit, when I got to Columbia, I took rocks for jocks. I wasn't trying to mess with the sciences. <laughs> I did. You know you did. You know some of us. Come on now. Was it <laughs> geology? That worked. You know, there was the requirement. I got it done. But she had very high expectations. And, and that's part of that courageousness um, that she pushed forward in us. And the stamina. You know, my mother went on to become a leader in the fight against HIV and AIDS for people of color around the globe. She was on President Clinton's Advisory Council on AIDS. President Bush asked her to continue to serve. And so in, in her professional work, she embodied all of those qualities and characteristics. So at, 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 in the end analysis, um, these lessons that I've gleaned from my own experiences watching some of my heroes and sheroes, I think are important. They help me, they ground me, um, and they're applicable. And they're important for Columbia. They're important for us as an institution that we have leaders that are visionary, setting bold goals, that are smart and strategic, and in the end, courageous having the stamina and, and the confidence to get the job done. Thank you very much for allowing me to share this with you.